Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. Well, you can bet that cheer is still traveling out in space this morning. Celebrating their achievement, sticking that landing in a boulder-strewn crater 450 million kilometers away on Mars. NASA scientists, they're already down to work on the science of the Perseverance mission, the Mars 2020 mission. These are the first images into us from the rover, and you can see Perseverance now sitting on what NASA calls the parking lot, a flat spot in the middle of cliffs, craters and sand dunes, but check out all the rocks, just a stone's throw away from the landing spot. Those are really interesting to the gentleman that you're going to meet. Well, not meet, he's been on our program before, but he's back with us. He is a geologist at the University of Alberta. He is one of the world's leading experts in the geology of Mars and Martian meteorites, and he is one of the scientists involved in Mars 2020. Professor Chris Hurd back with us from Edmonton. So great to have you. Good, good morning. Good morning. Thanks and for having me. Welcome again. back. If people have good memories, we spoke when when Perseverance launched. So of course we have to speak to you when Perseverance landed. Set it up for me. You couldn't be at Mission Control in these COVID times. Where were you watching yesterday, and with whom? I was sitting in, in front of the TV in my in my den with my wife, and uh, just yeah. That's where I watched it from, although we were connected through a kind of a social media app with other other science team members. <laughs> okay, the, the, so we're seeing these are the members there who actually were able to be there, jumping to their feet. We're going to go back to that picture because we can see you hands in the air as well. When you heard what we just heard there, that Perseverance is safely on the surface of Mars, your hands in the air, what are you thinking, what are you feeling? Oh, it was just astonishing. I mean, it was this sense of, uh, I mean, for, for anybody who watched it, I mean, that kind of countdown through the steps uh, of reaching the surface of Mars were just incredibly intense and suspenseful. And so it was a mixture, uh, it was really relief that it landed safely. And and we talked about this during the launch, you know, it, um, never witnessed a launch, you know, where, where I was so personally involved or invested and, and the same is absolutely true for the landing because there are a number of things that could have gone wrong in those what they call seven minutes of terror to get to the surface. Yeah, aptly named, aren't they? Really, you're, like your your adrenaline's racing and the blood pressure is just going up and up and up. And I'm sure for for especially for you having an involvement in it, we, we start we saw a little quick look at it, but we got I think it's even more quick return than I even was expecting, but the photos have already come back, some of those initial photos. So as you see them, what are you seeing in those photos, Professor, that catches your eye? Well, I mean, these are even just the initial photos. I mean, uh, taken through the, the lens cap, which has come off since. And so we can expect to see other really even better photos of the same area. But uh, we see what we, it means, as someone said, it's Mars. I mean, we see, we see certain uh, boulders of different sizes, you know, maybe sort of 10 centimeters or so. We see some uh, loose material, which we call regolith. And then, we, and then you can even kind of make out uh, a sand dune or two in the distance. So I'm betting that really piques your interest because we should tell people you're on the, the group, the return sample science team. So as you see material and rocks and stuff to study, explain to us when your work really kicks in and what specifically in simple terms for non-Mars experts like we are, what you're going to be doing. Well, we have a lot to do be, uh, before we can even start sampling because all of the systems on board this incredibly complex, I mean, this incredibly advanced rover have to be checked out. And uh, so there's a lot of that that happens over the next days and weeks and even months. And the the sample acquisition system, which is the, the part of the arm that reaches out and can drill a core and then kind of put it in the belly of of the rover, is one of the last things to get checked out. So it could be a while before we actually start sampling. But when we do, it's going to be in the context of the general exploration. Uh, one of the things that our, our PI, Ken Farley, mentioned uh, yesterday in a press conference is that we are, uh, we know where we landed and we are near a contact. And that for geologists, that's really exciting because a contact is where you can see from orbit that we're two potentially different rock types. And we're right close to that. And so that's really intriguing because 
that's you know that tells us there's just, there's a story there that needs to be sorted out. So that's going to be almost certainly one of the first things that that we do. But we also have a longer term plan to drive up onto the delta, for example, and do other exploration and collect samples as we go. And so now that we know where we've landed, we can start start to start putting that together with our, our longer term plan. And, and how will you know where to go? I mean, are you, you're getting data back all the time. You're actually able to see visually because you're, you're part of the team that, that says, you know, this is where we stop and this is where we look. And, and what tells you uh, to stop and look? We, we do need to do some mapping in the sense of, you know, when you're like if we're people out in the field or we take our students out in the field to to teach them how to map, you have to do that part first to sort of understand literally the lay of the land and the different rocks that are there. And then we make a decision, though, as a team, we'll make a decision as a team uh, to where do we think that the most significant samples are. Uh, and of course, you know, the driver for this mission is looking for evidence of ancient life. So. So there may not there be units that we we may not get to yet, maybe in the delta a little bit later, where that's most significant. But at the same time, you know, the rocks that we landed on or something like it, maybe I should just say maybe because it's a team decision, something that we want to sample. Return sample. I think we talked last time. Did I not ask you if you're a patient man? Because the actual samples don't come back to Earth until into the 2030s on a subsequent mission. So that's when you get to actually see them and then we have them back on Earth. But you're helping gather them and analyzing them using the, the equipment and that sophisticated technology that you have right now. You, you just made clear, I mean, we know what the goal of this mission is, is to understand if there ever has been life on, on Mars. Contemplating that, one of the great questions for humanity, if there's life elsewhere. If at the end of this, that is in fact proven, I mean, what do you think it'll change for us and for the world? Um, I, I think it'll, it'll change kind of our perspective on, on the potential for life elsewhere in our solar system and, and in the universe generally. Uh, in at the same time that we're making these explore this exploration of Mars and doing this fantastic thing of landing this rover yesterday, uh, this technological feat, uh, we're also uh, collectively humanity is looking at uh, other stars and, and finding more and more and more planets around them. And so, if we end up finding that even microbial life, you know, single-celled organisms existed on Mars three and a half billion years ago in this Jezero crater area it opens up the possibility that life could, at least microbial life, if not more complex life, could exist on any number of these other planets that we continue to discover all the time. And if it doesn't, I mean, that has implications too, doesn't it, for us on Earth? Either way. Absolutely. Abs either way, yeah. If we go through this whole process and we find the best possible samples, and, you know, that's that's the, the the great thing about this rover is we will be able to find and understand I think the environment the geological environment that existed at the time, and then take a sample from that. Uh, and if that environment was hospitable to, or like we call it habitable, right? But there was nobody living there, you know. It doesn't mean there wasn't ever any life on Mars, but certainly you would expect it to have been there, and that then increases the uniqueness of life that we have here on the Earth. So it really tells us that there's something absolutely even more special about the conditions that were existed on Earth that led to, to life here. Yeah, I love to just stop and think about this, the implications, uh, and how exciting for, for you to be right in this, this whole new era that's going to get us to some of these key questions. I love your T-shirt. You wear that proudly as you're part of this whole, <laughs> whole, uh, whole new push in science, and we're going to follow along on the journey with you. Thank you so much for coming back. It's great to check in with you, and enjoy the proud moment. Thank you. You're very welcome. Professor it's, Chris It's Hurd. a pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Love the smile. Thank you, Professor Hurd.